James chapter 1 this morning. We're going to focus on verse 5 through 8. The title of the sermon this morning is, In All Things, Get Wisdom. Starting in verse 5, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind, and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord, as we again come to you this morning, opening your word, studying the book of James, Lord, I pray that we'll learn the value of wisdom. And that we'll understand the difference between wisdom and knowledge. And that we'll understand even more, Lord. That, that we'll grasp a hold of the time in which this letter was written to help us to provide even further understanding of the power of this letter. And that it, it was divinely inspired in the fullness of time delivered uh, to a people who were facing things in which we've never heard, in which we've never seen people being sawn asunder, beheaded, tortured, fed the lions, ank- tied to anchors, cast into the sea, and dipped in burning oil. And even the author of this letter would soon face his own death by being thrown down from the temple and being stoned. And yet, in the midst of all of these trials, in the midst of all of these tragedies, in the midst of great persecution, last week we opened up to understand, he said, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations. Lord, teach us what it means to have wisdom So that in times of trial, so that in times of trouble, that we can understand how to count it all joy. Because even in our own frail human minds, it's hard to picture how to remain joyful in such uncertain times. But that's what the emphasis is this morning. This is why we need to get wisdom. Lord, we thank you for this opportunity. Thank you for those who gathered here this morning. I pray that you pour out your spirit upon us, Lord, and give me the words to speak. Bless our hearts this morning as we together glean from your word. We thank you for all that you've done. And bless, with, bless the teachers next door working with the children. In Jesus' name, amen. Troubles, trials, temptations, tribulations. These are words all familiar to our ears. And maybe even more familiar to our hearts. Last week we we seen as James opened up here in the book of James, we seen the Christian life is filled with trouble. The Christian life is filled with trials. The Christian life is filled with temptations. But James said, When your counting right, when your math is right, when you can properly add and divide about what's really going on in life, all the troubles in the world, all the trials in the world, and all the temptations of the world can be counted for joy. And because you realize in these moments, in these trials, in these troubles, the chafe of our life, the fodder of our life, the things in our life that have no value to God are being burned away. And that at the end of each trial and at the end of each trouble, if we will just keep our eyes focused on God, that when we come forth from all of these situations, that we will be more like him. And this should be the desire of all of our Christian lives. We want to be more like God. We want to be more like Christ. We want to have that kind of life. We want to be known for having a heart for preaching his word, teaching his word, a heart for compassion for people and all of that. We want to be like Christ, but we don't want the trials that he went through. But for the Christian life, trials are waiting for us. 
when we closed out last week, we, we talked about Job. Job said of his trials and the hardest trials of his life, when he hath tried me, I shall come forth as gold. You say, I don't have that, brother. I don't have that. I don't have the ability to come forth as gold because I don't have the ability to face the trials. When we face trials, brother, it seems that's when I stop praying. When I'm in the thick of the trials, it seems that's when I stop reading. James says no. It's the exact opposite. And that's what we see here in verse 5. He lays it out for us that you will have troubles. He lays it out for us you will have problems. He lays it out even further that you should count it all joy. And when you start to step back and you say, how can you count it all joy when people are being burned? How can you count it all joy when people are being sawn asunder? And the follow up to that of all of the tragedies that's going on when James is writing this letter to the, to the scattered, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad he says the way that you're going to have joy in all of this is when you get wisdom see you don't have no wisdom about what's going on here and that prevents you from having joy and not joy that one of your brethren are dying but you come to an understanding and joy that you know that no matter what happens even if it's your own life that God is at work you know, it, it, in this declaration in verse 5, it is to say, we need wisdom. It's not separate from the book of last week. It is a supporting portion of the text. Through our weak eyes, we struggle to find joy in trials, troubles, tribulations. James adds that it's due to the lack of wisdom. And let me tell you that wisdom, let me tell you what wisdom is not. Wisdom is not understanding all that is going on. How can we ever understand all that is going on in our lives? How can we understand all the troubles that we face in our life? How could we ever really understand it? We are just men. How, can I, how could we ever understand the tragedies of this life that we experience? Like with our weak human minds, that we can actually fully understand the plan that God is working that will one day bring glory to Him. How could we ever understand that with our minds? We are just men. Wisdom is knowing God. Wisdom is that we know that through all of our pains, through all of our lives, through all of our highs, through all of my highs, through all of my lows, through all of your highs, and through all of your lows, that God is working in the end of it all to weave something so beautiful that in the end will bring Him greater glory. There will be something woven in the midst of all of these tra tragedies that will bring glory to him. We may never understand in this life the hard things of this life. Wisdom is knowing that we do not have to. We don't have to understand what's going on. I think that oftentimes that we think that after salvation, we're now just these wise creations. Verse 5 is the acknowledgement that that is not the case. That just because you're saved doesn't mean you now know how to handle life. And verse 5 is actually a declaration. Now that you're saved, you know where to go to how to handle life. It's an acknowledgement that we do not have enough wisdom to make it through. But it's also the reality of that it means that we do not quit either. It means ask. We oftentimes do not like to ask for things because when we ask for things, it's the reality that we look vulnerable. And that we're the one in need. And that we are the one who is in desperate need of help. And that there's a situation happening outside of our control. Satan offers the opportunity for wisdom to believers also. And that's how Eve was beguiled in the garden. Wisdom is offered, but where will we go for wisdom? 
Where will we go when we don't understand how to handle troubles? Where will we go when we don't know how to handle situations? See, the carnal side of us does this. We say, one side of us, we have full faith in God. And God, we believe that God has preserved his word, revealed his word for us, and this is the guidance for our life. This is the final word for faith and practice. We read this, we study this, and this is going to guide us through the working of the Holy Spirit. He will make it clear to us in the way which we should go. And we say that this is exactly what we believe. This is exactly what is the purpose of our life, that God is going to guide us through the trials. But the problem is, is that we say such a thing and we pray about it. But then the same result, we go and try to figure out another way in our own carnal flesh about how to make things right. James says, this is, this is not going to work. We're going to ask God. But when we ask God, we need to ask in faith. We need to ask in faith to God for wisdom. He said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. First, I want to see the heart of this supply. The heart of it. What is the heart in which this wisdom is supplied to us? In the maintenance field, we have something that we call a greenhorn. And maybe in your field you have something kind of a familiar term. When someone is a novice at their job, you say, they're just green. And usually when you say that someone's green, it limits the amount of task that they can do because they are, they are a novice to their job. Yet in this greenhorn mentality, most of the people who are not greenhorns take much joy messing with greenhorns. I know I've been through this even myself. Greenhorns get messed with all the time because they are expected to have every tool. They're expected to know every step they're supposed to take, and yet they know absolutely nothing about their job. They're sent after tools that don't exist. And this is, a, this is like a rite of passage for their new career. And you know what? In the right spirit, it can be funny at times. But you know what? After they get experience after they get a better understanding of their job, they know what tools they are expected to have. And you know what? They're expected to know where to find the tools. And if you don't, you only get a harder time. The experience brings about a sense of accountability. But notice what the text says here. It does not come in fogging the existing believer about why they are struggling. It, it doesn't come about saying, you guys should know better than this. I mean, why aren't you guys asking me for wisdom? That's not the context. It's not like we even studying on Wednesday night in the book of Galatians. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ. That's not the heart of the supply here. That's not the heart of the matter. And this isn't a strong rebuke. This is a call out that there is help, that there is hope, that there is a heart of supply that rests for the believer. And that there is a, there is a hope and it rests in the wisdom of God in our life. The Lord, through the writing of James, does not chastise those that belong to him only to draw a light to where they can get help. James says trials are hard, temptations are hard, but if you are lacking supply, but if you are lacking understanding, closer than any friend, closer than any book is the Lord. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. No wonder the proverb said, while you're getting things and getting all things, the principal thing is to get wisdom. And while you're getting wisdom, get understanding. God not only offers a wisdom to us, but in the heart of this supply is one of the most beautiful sides of this. Not only does he offer us wisdom, not only does he offer this to, those, to them that come and ask, he said, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that Giveth to all men liberally, and abradeth not, and it shall be given unto him. 
He giveth liberally. And this is how God gives. And this is not like when you go to the petting zoo and you feed little rations to the animals to keep them close to the fence. God gives to us in our need, in our supply, in wisdom, liberally. He literally pours it out upon us. It's not so much God's desire that we be weak and feeble creatures, that every step we take we have to come back and ask for wisdom, but in the sense that in the path that we are on, we come to God, we ask for Him to give us wisdom, and He pours it upon us liberally, that we see the way, that we see the path that He has laid out for us. Even in the Word of God, if you will just take the Word and read the Word, you will even see that it is even true for us today that He hath poured wisdom upon us liberally, even through His Word. 613 commandments, they say, are in the Word of God, and each of those are still relevant to us today. We have a whole book of Proverbs. We have parables of the Lord, which is to impart to us wisdom. We have the entire Gospels, which lets us see our Lord and Savior even more clearly. We have the epistles, which lets us see what it means to have joy in all circumstances, what it means to have a fake Christianity, what it means to be sold out for God, and what it means to see judgment in the end of all times. We have all of these divine truths, all of this wisdom poured out to us in the word of God and even better John 14 26 says that you're not left alone to understand it that the spirit is with us how far would we be if we would just get in the word of God if we would just seek God and ask for wisdom if we would just act like Samuel did in the Old Testament, when we get in the Word of God, when we, when, we, when we know that God has called us to do things, when we're experiencing things, when we're going through troubles, when we're going through trials, if we would get in the, in the prayer closet, if we would get open in this Word of God and say, Speak, Lord, thy servant heareth. Show me thy words. Guide me in your word. Help me to see thy truth. Show me thy truth. James said, if any of you lack wisdom, you need the author of this book because he can provide unlimited understanding, which was given to us to show. Listen, we all need wisdom in this life. He'll go on to address the men who think that they don't need wisdom. And they're like the waves of the sea, tossed to and fro. The heart of this supply is that we can go to God and ask, and he will give to all of us liberally. No buffeting you. We, you should have come sooner. No chastising you that you should have came long ago. Just come and ask. Also notice this. There is no heartache in this supply. No heartache at all. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that, give, that giveth to all men liberally, and the key words here, and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. What do you mean no heartache in this giving? This word abradeth means to rail. It means to chide. It means to taunt. Let me help you to put this in kind of a, a perspective. Maybe I'm the only person that knows people kind of like this, right? Maybe even in your own personal life, you maybe have been there one time where you found yourself maybe short on some money, right? Where your finances are a little tight. And you possibly know somebody who has the finances and could easily allow you to borrow the money to get you through, but you would rather starve to death than even ask them for $10 because you know that it's going to come with 10 years worth of reminders about how you're irresponsible with your money and how you have to keep coming back to me and they remind you and they taunt you and they chide you even though you've paid it back you can never get away from the fact that you've borrowed money from them every time you see them four score and seven years ago you can't even talk about buying a race car track for your kid without them reminding 
about how irresponsible you are with your money because you borrowed $10 or even more. I, I know Christians like this, that they have a lot of knowledge about the word of God. They, they have a lot of wisdom about the Word of God. God has blessed them with the intellect to know a lot of things about the Word of God. But I guess because patience is not finished working, it's uh, performing its perfect work in them, when you go to them and ask questions about the Word of God, they unleash a tirade about how ignorant you are and they can't believe you've made it this far and not understanding the truths of God's Word. I know people just like that. How did you ever make it this far? I, I can't believe you would ask such a silly question. Make you feel dumb for even asking. This is what James is promising here. While it's good to have friends that know a lot. While it's good to have friends that uh, may not berate you. It's great to have a God who doesn't taunt you. Who doesn't, tr uh, who doesn't chide you. Who that he not only gives to you liberally, but even though you have to keep coming back and coming back and coming back, and maybe it's even over the same situation, he doesn't berate us. He doesn't slander us. He doesn't talk down to us. That is not how God works in giving wisdom. When we go to him in seeking wisdom, it is to make a, a confession that we want to be more like him. We want to understand more of his word. This wisdom is not just knowledge. Wisdom, this word wisdom, carries about a physical action that follows after it. I know a lot of people who are extremely, extremely smart, but practically, biblically stupid. I watched an article last week, and it was about this NASA engineer, and he did this whole documentary on ABC, and this guy was brilliant on all the different things that he worked on. But you know what? He got caught up in drugs, well, lost his job, fired from his career. He died, book smart, but he failed at life. He failed the test. Tons of knowledge. Uh, you know what? Even more. Just a couple weeks ago, last week or the week before, my mom called me and said, all the lights are out in the basement. This is easy. I'm just going to replace all of the light fixtures. So I started off, and this same light fixture has given me problems before. So I studied this light fixture so that I knew exactly how to put this light fixture back in. But the problem was, I did that light fixture last. I should have done it first. I did all the other light fixtures. When I came to this light fixture, you know what I realized? All the confidence that I had that I knew exactly how to do this light fixture went out to the door, went out the door when I tried to hook up the light fixture, which resulted in a phone call to Brother Green to help me hook up this light fixture. When it came to the test, the knowledge that I believed I had was wrong. When it came to the test of actually doing the task, all the things that I thought was retained in my mind was really not retained. I thought I knew how to do it, but I had no way to apply it. This is the difference between wisdom and knowledge. Knowledge says you know what the Word of God says. Wisdom means that God has given you the ability to put it into action. And this is where rubber meets the road. It's more than just saying God is sovereign. It's more than saying God is faithful. It's more than saying God is just. It's more than saying I'm just going to trust the Lord through this situation. It's trusting the Lord through this situation. It is that your behavior matches the speech. It is that the mind knowledge is a heart knowledge. This is what wisdom is oftentimes for us as believers we believe we have a knowledge about how to handle situations but when it comes time we face the trials and we fail wisdom always has a correct physical response it does remember what the lord said over in the book of matthew in regard to what a wise man will look like 
Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, key here, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon the rock, and the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them not, shall be likened unto the foolish man. You see? And there's the difference of the application. The wise man heard it, and he did it, and the Lord likened him unto the wise man. The Lord likened unto the foolish man, the one who heard it, who did not do it. And you know what? In the end, it said, he shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And when the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew, it beat upon the house and it fell. And great was the fall of it. Great was the fall of it. Wisdom is hearing and doing, not just hearing. Wisdom is going through the trial. And instead of saying, when we're going through trials, and I think we're all guilty of this. As a matter of fact, I think we're guilty of this when we speak to each other. When we know that each other's going through a trouble or a trial in each other's life, we say, hey, how you doing, brother? I could really use some grace right now. I could really use some mercy. I could really use some help. I could really use some relief. I could really use some encouragement. And I believe all those things are good. But I, my point is, how do we know exactly sometimes what we really need in these situations? Unless we first go to God and ask for wisdom. How and what do we need to weather storms if we have no wisdom from God about what we really need to weather a storm? Wisdom is going to God and saying, I don't know what I need, but I need you. I need guidance. I need understanding. I need to have what you need me to have to get through this storm so that on the other side of this, glory is given to you. James is saying, I'm sure that all of these things are needed and good, meaning relief, help, and wisdom, but uh, w relief and help, but get wisdom. And, if, and see if that doesn't change how you handle your situations. Wisdom can make a cancer patient a gospel preacher. Wisdom will make a victim into a light. God's wisdom is where the believer actually goes from knowing something to responding something, to the something, to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. Now you know how, you know, you want to know how to handle all the things that are going on in life to the 12 tribes scattered abroad? Get this wisdom. And one last thing about this wisdom. Wisdom does not mean that you know the entire word of God by heart. Wisdom does not mean that you know all the answers. Wisdom is knowing that you don't, but taking confidence that you are in a close relationship with someone that does. You see, the heart of this supply is that God gives and that he gives liberally. And you also see that there's no heartache from this, that God does not chide us in this giving and that we keep returning to him. Also notice this, the heartfelt request from the believer in verse 6. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, with the wind and tossed. For let, not the, for, let, for let not that man thinketh that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Let him ask in faith. Hebrews 11.1 1 is one of the clearest definitions of what faith is. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. And you know what else Hebrews 11 says? If you go on to verse 6, it says, And it's impossible to please him without faith. Mean, meaning this, that when we ask our, meaning that when we ask in our request, they should be asked in faith. And when we ask in faith, we understand that God may answer those requests. And you know what we should also understand? That God may not answer those requests. 
Um, but even if God doesn't answer our request, even if God doesn't answer our request about how to make it through the trials of this life, it means that just because he didn't answer those requests, that we don't all of a sudden stop believe that God is going to answer them. It means that we, in this wisdom, when we have wisdom, we understand that no matter what we are facing, even when God doesn't answer, even when God doesn't work in the manner, in the time frame that we seem necessary, that even though he doesn't, when we operate in faith, it means that we're trusting that no matter what happens in here, that we're not going to move and we're going to trust that God is going to do his work here. When we ask in faith, we believe that God is going to give us the wisdom to make it through the trial. And that until we get the wisdom, we're not going to move further on. When we do this, we will not be subject to what the end of verse 6 through 8 says. When we are tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine, as Paul told the Ephesians, we find ourselves wavering. We are not to be tossed to and fro, though. We're not to be doubters, as this verse would lead us to understand. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given unto him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. And this is to say, not doubting. Not to be doubters on God. Well, I doubt sometimes. We all struggle, I think, in times with doubting. But my doubt most of the time is not based upon can God do something. It's based upon do, am I in the exact place that God would have me to be in my own spiritual life. But the truth is that we shouldn't be doubting God at all. We shouldn't be going to him wavering to and fro. We shouldn't be going to him wavering about who he is. We shouldn't be going to him wavering about can he do it. When we believe in faith, we lift our request up to God, believing that he is God and believing that he does have the ability to handle it, that he does have the ability to deliver us, and that we're not tossed to and fro, that we should be the ones to handle this, but that God will handle this. The emphasis here with the sea. But let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. When we was down in Florida, my in-laws decided that we should go down to Shark Tooth Island and dig in the sand in the water and collect shark tooth, shark teeth. Well, the problem was those waves were so bad, so choppy, that not a lot of people wanted to go in there. So, you know, I was the elected guy to go out and fill everybody's pans, bring it back to the shore so that they could sift through the sand and find shark teeth. You know what? You know what I learned about the sea? You know what I learned about the ocean? You can't trust the waves. You can't. You, I turned my back to it so that it would stop splashing in my face. And then I thought, well, this is perfect. All I need to do is time this. And when the wave hit me in the back, I thought, now it's safe to bend over. But it was a lie. It would work one time and the next minute it didn't. And then you know what happened? The wave that was pushing me to the shore was now dragging me back out to the ocean. I was all over the place, even that night alone. The abuse for those few short hours in the ocean, I couldn't even sleep laying down because I kept feeling like the waves were beating me all over the place. This is exactly what James is trying to say here. These, when, we, when, we, when we ask in faith, there's a trust factor here. There's a, a reality factor that we know who God is. But when we doubt God, we are the ones who are wavering like a wave in the sea. We're in, we're out. 
We're here one moment, we're there the next. And God's going to do it, God's not going to do it. One day Peter can, one moment Peter can walk on water, the next moment Peter's sinking. And Moses says, I can handle it, and then he gets to the Red Sea and he says, I can't handle it. And God delivers them from the Red Sea, and they walk across, and then the next thing it's a rock, and then it's manna. One moment it's good, one moment it's not. We are to be moving in faith. Moving in faith, trusting that God is exactly who he says he is. And not only who he says he is, but who he says he is to us. We have no reason to doubt God. None at all. He closes in verse 8 and says this. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. You see that? A double-minded man is unstable in some of his ways. No. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man will say, I'm trusting God, and then try to make a way for himself. A double-minded man perishes at the crossroads of life. There's no decision. There's no faith. Well, which way to go? How will I go there? What is the path to take? He will never know because he'll travel a little on this road and then come back. And he'll travel a little on this road and come back. He will die in the world of indecision because he is so double-minded. And, and by the way, in a sense, not making a decision is also making a decision. You can have your mind set on following God and live for the world. And on, you can have your mind set on following God and live for the world. On the way here, you know, some of you cannot have your mind set. I, I can wrote this down. You cannot have your mind set on following God and living for the world. To give it to you this way, when some of you, when you came here, you probably listened to the radio. You know what? You listen probably to FM radio. I don't like FM radio. Matter of fact, when me and my wife, we go and travel, that's about the only time we listen to the radio in the car. Outside of that, she just wants me to talk to her. She just wants to hear my voice, even if I ramble. So, but when we're in the car, she hates AM radio. I love it. I like talk radio. She doesn't. But you know what? We can't play AM and FM at the same time. It's either one or the other. And in the same breath, a double-minded man, right? He's unstable in all his ways. We cannot say that we as Christians are going to live in faith, act in faith, serve God, seek wisdom, follow wholeheartedly after him, and try to play the AM station. It's either one or the other. You cannot be both. We're either moving forward in children of faith, seeking the Father in wisdom, acting, in, acting not in knowledge, but in faith as we move through. Or we're going to reap the consequences of our instability. We're going to reap the rewards of a faithless life. What's the rewards of a faithless life? See, what is the rewards of it? It's no peace. It's no guidance. It's no hope. It's tossed to and fro from day to day and unstable in all our ways. This is what James is telling to the 12 tribes scattered abroad. This is the message even to Christians today. How are you ever going to survive the trials in life? It's real simple. Go to God and get wisdom. And when you ask, ask in faith. That's the story. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to be in your word, Lord. May, may we, Lord, even in our own lives, as we evaluate each and every situation, seek you first in wisdom. Before we make the proclamation of our needs, Lord, may we say to you, in, Lord, give us wisdom so that we could even understand what we really need to get through this storm, to get through this trial that will bring you glory. May we see that really our lives is all about bringing him glory. And when we see it's all about bringing him glory, maybe at times we may be requesting the wrong relief. When we may want relief from the storm when it's time for strength. God, give us wisdom to understand how to be a light for you. Lord, may it be more than a, a, a mind knowledge. 
And may we be able to apply it every step of the way. We give thanks to you for all that you've done. In Jesus' name, amen.